Hello, and welcome. I hope you're all doing well on this fine 33 degree Australian day. Um, I'm joined in this essay reading by my fan, which you might hear in the background, um, a glass of water, a cup of coffee, and a cup of coffee. The, um, the, the elixirs of life. Um, this is a different video than what has been posted on this account before, but I hope to kind of do more of it, um, considering we're all in self-isolation at the moment. I mean, except for casual workers who still have to go to work, um, but, you know, that's <sighs> it's annoying, but whatever. Um, so this, this essay that I wrote was for a second year unit at university called Philosophy of Film, which sort of tackled a bunch of different theories to do, but it was mostly focused on like intro to philosophy, kind of Descartes, things like that, and relating it generally to film, um, with a heavy emphasis on Stanley Cavell, who really has shaped a lot of sort of philosophical understandings of film, Br taking, taking philosophy out of the sciences and putting it back into the humanities. Um, him and Deleuze really are kind of share in that. Um, so this was my final essay. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm recording this reading because I don't know if I would ever like publish it or anything like that. Um, because it's mostly a summative thing while also applying it to my own ideas, but well, applying it to my own examples, I suppose. It's really more of a top-down method of of writing, which isn't really my bread and butter. I prefer to integrate theories and ideas throughout, but the essay question sort of called for more of a top-down method wherein I present the theory first and then begin to go into the texts. Not really my cup of tea, but let I don't know. I think I did well. I did do well, and I uh, hope you enjoy. The question that I was responding to was, um, Stanley Cavell says, film is a moving image of skepticism. Critically discuss what does he mean by this remark? What might one think film or the conditions of cinematic spectatorship engage? What, uh, why might one think of the Oh, this is really weirdly phrased, this question. Um, why, why might one think of the, con of the conditions of cinematic spectatorships uh, uh, engage with the traditional Cartesian problem of external world skepticism? How important is this engagement for understanding film? Explain! Alright, so, uh, let's get this road on the show. Okay. So, according, according to Stanley Cavell in his 1979 book, The World Viewed, film is a moving image of skepticism, suggesting the conditions of cinema reflect the philosophical ideas of René Descartes and his ruminations on the separation between the mind and the body. Understanding that film is a medium where bodies are separate from one another, and the connection between other minds is fragmented enhances our ontology of movies and the power it holds to build empathy within the individual. Michael Haneke's 71 Fragments of a Chronology of Chance recognizes the dialectical boundaries of the mind and the body and forces audiences to recognize how film is a medium that facilitates this skeptical divide but ultimately bridges these imaginary borders through its advocations of empathy and acknowledgement towards other minds. An understanding of Cavell's assertions that cinema is a moving image of skepticism can only be understood through a knowledge of Cartesian skepticism that serves as the basis of modern philosophy. Skepticism emerged from the meditations on first philosophy by René Descartes where he began to call everything in existence into doubt, asserting that its greatest benefit lies in freeing us from all our preconceived opinions and providing the easiest route by which the mind may be led away from the senses. 
He goes on to imagine a fantastical situation in which some demonic or godlike force has trapped him within a world of illusion and imagination, where everything including his senses are fabricated and rendered futile, leaving him distrusting of supposedly epistemic truths and his own grasp on reality. In order to discern between the rational and irrational, the real and the unreal, he realised that it was necessary to demolish everything and rebuild his ontological knowledge of the world and his experience from the ground up if he wanted to establish anything at all that was stable and likely to last. Lamenting his cognitive disillusionment and disequilibrium that he has now opened up, he recognises that most humans would rather remain within this falsity rather than face these objective truths that he is raising, asserting through simile that he is like a prisoner, enjoying an imaginary freedom while asleep, and as he begins to suspect that he is asleep, he dreads being woken up and goes along with the pleasant illusion as long as he can. Sifting through the possibilities of this newfound realisation, Descartes finally concludes one certainty within this sceptical universe. I know, that I, I know that I exist, I am, I exist, is necessarily true whenever it is put forward by me or conceived in my mind. Thought alone is inseparable from me. Here the I that Descartes is referring to. Uh, the, here the I that Descartes refers to is his mind, or rather the part of his mind that is actively thinking, his consciousness. Everything outside of this con consciousness, however, can be called into doubt, and a protracted series of existential questioning, including one's own body, the bodies of others, and even the existence of their minds, to suggest that another individual body has a mind, or an eye, is not, epistemic th is not epistemically truthful. It can be called into question due to the nature of the physical body to obfuscate metaphysical objects such as the conscience. According to David MacArthur in his lecture on Other Mind Skepticism, you cannot determine whether someone else has a mind based on bodily behaviour as it is a mere outer effect of an inner mind that can only be inferred to explain it, just as the individual cannot determine the existence of their own mind through their own bodily movement. It is only through the process of thinking that you can truly determine that you exist. MacArthur goes on to discuss Stanley Cavell and the connection he draws between film and scepticism suggesting that the medium recognises a manifestation of philosophy's fall into scepticism, where the film's world is both present to us and mechanically absent to us as audiences. As Cavell puts it, film is a moving image of scepticism. Not only is there a reasonable possibility, it is a fact that here our normal senses are satisfied of reality, while reality does not exist, even alarmingly because it does not exist, because viewing it is all it takes. In this way, Descartes suggest, Descartes' suggestion that he is a prisoner enjoying an imaginary freedom. Audiences... Oh. In this way, much like Descartes... In this way, much like Descartes' suggestion that he is a prisoner enjoying an imaginary freedom, audiences oscillate in a state of knowing and unknowing, believing the reality of the film while also doubting this very same diegesis. It is in this dialectical intersection where Cavell, remark, where Cavell marks the relationship between Cartesian scepticism and film. Therefore, film is a moving image of scepticism due to the inherent epistemic fog of doubt that is cast over a medium situated in bringing moments of other spaces and times to audiences in an instant allowing viewers to enter a world that is both fantastical and real, and this divide between illusion and the objective is where Cartesian doubt seeps its way into a philosophical idea of the medium. While Cavell's explanation for the relationship between film and scepticism is useful, David MacArthur extrapolates on these ideas more in his article Living Our Skepticism of Others Through Film, Remarks in Light of Cavell and it is through these connections that audiences may be able to figure out these notions of our 
into our own readings of films. As MacArthur reinforms, the filmic state of skepticism is the experience of being vouchsafed a glimpse into a reality that has already occurred, both knowledgeable of its non-existence, but also drawn to his supposed objective diegesis. As MacArthur observes, skepticism makes it seem as if the mind is enclosed within a circle of its own subjective or inner experiences, unable to ever reach the world beyond them, whereas film makes this sceptical gap appear natural on Cavell's view because its images have the power to convince us of the reality we witness, that it is precisely reality, not, the represent not representations of reality, not a proxy of reality, that is present to us in the images of on screen. However, the act of being an audience member where you, are where you are rendered immobile and are merely displayed the images in front of you with no access of engaging with these supposed worlds fulfills Descartes' sceptical worldview, where reality is seemingly just outside of the individual's grasp. Attempts to bridge this sceptical gap, on the other hand, has recurred throughout filmic history, with a push towards greater realism in the medium, with technological innovations such as 3D, widescreen, surround sound, stereo systems, and the oft-forgotten smell -o vision all avenues towards bringing the viewer into the world of the diegesis. As Cavell points out, in contrast, we have given up the idea that connection with reality is to be understood as provision with likeness. In this way, when, when an audience member sits down to watch Ben-Hur in a theatre with Cinemascope, while their entire field of vision may be taken up by the screen, that does not mean they are entering the reality of the film as the provision of likeness does not inherently create a connection with reality. Similarly, technological innovations with computer-generated imagery CGI, in films such as Avengers Endgame, where the individual bodily hairs and wrinkles on animated characters such as the Hulk or Thanos do not automatically suck an audience member out of their immobile illusion into the supposed reality of the film, as this likeness does not automatically destroy or undermine the epistemic doubt that skepticism has thrown into our viewing of cinema. Reinforcing these Cavellian notions, MacArthur points further evidence, provides further evidence towards the medium's skeptical nature suggesting that film presents us with an imaginary world that allows us somehow to see others unseen, rendering our position voyeuristic in nature, while also creating an epistemic distance between viewer and diegesis. In Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, after having followed the perspective of who we believe to be the main character, Marion Crane, to the Bates Motel and into a suspenseful conversation between herself and Norman Bates, the camera stays on the voyeuristic killer once she leaves her to her room, and we are given a glimpse into a moment that would be private for other characters within the diegesis, but not for us. While this can be read as being given access to into his mind, we are still rendered outside of their body, and thus, and thus cannot engage with Norman's mind, rendering a psychoanalytic diagnosis of his actions futile, as we still can't bridge the gap of other minds' skepticism, despite seeing what would normally be unseen. First-person narrators who directly address the audience, such as David Finch's Fight Club, would seem to solve this existential question, as we are privy to the protagonist's state of mind, drawing a connection between the minds of the audience and the minds of the characters, allowing us to see the unseen or hear the unheard. However, this is called into doubt by the antagonist Tyler Durden, who is a product of the protagonist's imagination, and the audience soon discovers that they have been tricked by the main character's own mind just as he tricked himself, making the twist all the more shocking as it directly shatters the connection we thought we had with the protagonist. Situated thus, film is a medium of sceptical imaginings, where the audience is rendered immobile and cannot access the world they are given glimpses to, and while some filmmakers have, a have attempted to bridge this epistemic and ontological gap, there is always doubt that is cast into the minds of audiences that keeps that distance palpable.
While recognising the sceptical nature of film may seem like a null point on the surface, MacArthur argues that it can help our understandings of both film and our relation to others, which is exemplified through a reading of Michael Haneke's 71 fragments of a chronology of chance. Tracing the lives of a group of people who we are told will die in a mass shooting on a particular date in an intertitle at the beginning of the film, 71 Fragments fulfills the assertion that film is a medium of scepticism through its long takes of seemingly innocuous situations, intermittent news segments that disrupt the flow of the narrative to deliver random bits of footage from a 24-hour news cycle, and no narration to get inside the minds of the protagonists. As an audience member, you remain distant from the actions that occur throughout the film, as you are given access to the deterministic temporal outcome of what will take place at the end, and you are left in cold isolation from the, from the protagonists, emphasised by the film's stark white saturated colour palette. MacArthur argues, however, that our access to these private vignettes in these people's lives can be viewed not through a sceptical lens. He asserts that by seeing others unseen, it is audiences deliberate, deliberately seeking respite from the ordinary condition of acknowledging others whom we confront in our daily lives. In this way, watching movies is a panacea to our apathy towards other minds, emphasised in the poor beggar child in Haneke's film who spends most of the runtime ignored by adults. This is reinforced in the climax, where the gunman kills several people and the camera holds on an extreme close-up of a pool of blood, slowly seeping out of the body of a man. This is juxtaposed by the next sequence, in which a news report presents the scene in extreme long, tape, long shots without showing any close-ups of the bodies or the violence, while negating any backstories for the people whose lives were lost. Slotting this news report into an already existing report from earlier in the film, it plays on the audience's lack of empathy towards the previous intercut segments of news footage, trusting that we would, have, we would not have retained much memory of those individual moments from earlier, which are now imbued with more power by our sudden recognition of these other minds. As MacArthur asserts, film invites an exploration of the very conditions of acknowledgement themselves, as Hanukkah forces us to recognise our lack of acknowledgement towards others outside the realm of cinema, fulfilling audiences' need for film to present a realm of unknownness from which we explore our everyday scepticism of each other. MacArthur concludes that we enter these unknown spaces of acknowledgement in the hope of discovering, in the further reaches of the intelligibility of word, expression and gesture on screen, new possibilities of trust faith and companionship in our lives outside. As a result, Hanukkah's film can be seen to offer a way of bridging other minds' scepticism by asserting that bodies and individuals who may seem distant actually have their own lives, emotions, hopes and dreams that we are not privy to. Our lack of knowledge of these other people's lives, propagated by not only our own lack of acknowledgement, but also the apathetic news cycles that present people in harsh, vacant wide shots can be bridged by, the, by an acknowledgement and by taking the time to see what is usually unseen of their world. Therefore, 71 fragments of a chronology of chance advocates for a resolution of other minds' scepticism, as it can be dangerous towards our capacity for empathy, asserting that film is the medium of acknowledgement and that we must acknowledge other minds outside of the realm of the cinema. Positioned thus, Cavell's assertion that film is a moving image of scepticism can help broaden our understanding of cinema, allowing us to recognise the trans transformatic nature of the medium as a pathway towards acknowledgement and empathy of other minds. Hanukkah's 71 Fragments of a Chronology of Chance exemplifies the mind-body problem of Descartes in relation to film, but ultimately advocates for a recognition of and connection with others through its filmic language that attempts to bridge the minds of audiences with the diegetic characters of the movie.